Okay, we're being recorded. Okay, so it's my pleasure to have William Franca to speak here. He was actually my uh, office mate in house mate. That's the true. First, the first person I've seen in the United States, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> and I'm very happy to see Richard this year as well to, to see his talk. Uh, okay, so William, go for it. Oh, thank you, Braga. Th thanks for the invitation. All right, so thank the, the audience for, for, for being here today, right? So this afternoon, what I have planned is this. I'm gonna talk a little bit about multiplicative linear functionals and maximal ideals, all right? So uh, my talk is divided in basically four parts, all right? At the first part, we are gonna establish some notation and terminology, right? At the second part, we are going to talk about two algebras that we are going to, I mean, they're going to play an important role in this talk. At the third part, we are going to talk very briefly, but it's going to be very important to talk about the dual of the algebra MM, right? And at the end, we are going to talk about the spectrum of UTM of X, all right? So, so let me just fix some notation, right? As usual, C will denote the field of the complex numbers, right? By A, I, I mean uh, in a unital complex Banner algebra, right? So far, the, the algebra is not necessarily commutative, right? For those who are not familiar of Banner algebras, Banner algebra is precisely a Banner space, right? Where we do have a product, right? In other words, we can actually multiply elements of the vector space, right? And they, the, the multiplication it has to satisfy this condition. This, this is the quality with respect to the norm. I mean, the norm of the product is less or equal than the norm, the product of the norms, right? And that is supposed to hold for all A and B, right? And since we assume that the algebra is unital, that means we, we have an element E such that E times A is gonna be A times E equals A. And that holds for all A, okay? So just a very, just a, a comment here from this condition, we have that the multiplication is a continuous operation, all right? Of course, in the Cartesian product. And as usual, we are gonna denote the topological dual of the algebra by A star, all right? So, and, the, the, and by the dual, we mean the set formed by all uh, continuous linear functionals, all right? So just to illustrate, let me provide three very short examples of Ben algebras, all right? The first one is an example of a non-commutative Ben algebra, right? So by B of A, we mean the, the set formed by all linear and continuous linear transformations, all right, between A to itself, right? And this set, this vector, this Banner space, right? This is a Banner space when we, we quit with the soup norm, right? And if we also consider the composition as the, as the product, we have that B of A is actually a Banner algebra, right? and also a unital one. In this case, the identity operator behaves as the, as the, as the unit, all right? So, and another two examples, very standard ones, right? The C is the Banner algebra of all convergence, complex convergent sequences, okay? And when we equip C with the soup norm, right? We have a Banner algebra, right? Just to, to make it clear, the multiplication is component wise, Okay, uh, and that in other words, the multiplication, we're gonna multiply each entry with corresponding entry, all right, with, with itself, right? And in this case, we have a commutative Banner algebra and this algebra is also unital because the, the constant sequence one, 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 right? It behaves as the, the units of the, the Banner algebra C, okay? And the second example is, is, is just more, you know, to illustrate that we can, we can have Banner algebras that we, they are non-unital. And as the, in this case, we have C0, right? Is the sequence that converts to zero, right? And this, this Banner algebra is non-unital since, right? This sequence right over here does not lie in C0. So, 
So this is basically just a very few comments that I want to make regarding Bennett algebra, right? Now, uh, I, I need to remind some definitions from more algebraic point of view, okay? So I wanted to remind you guys what I mean by a ideal, all right? When I say ideal, I'm assuming that's a two-sided ideal. Ideals in algebras are exactly what? They are subspace, right? Where they have to satisfy this condition, all right? I A has to be containing I and I, and I'm sorry, and A I has to be containing I for, for every single element. So let me say is this. So I, just, just okay. I, uh, vector space, right? This is gonna be an ideal if A times little i belongs to i and i times little a also belongs to i and it is supposed to hold for all a in the algebra and for all i in the vector space. Okay, ideals are subspace that satisfies these two conditions. All right, so let me proceed, right? And we say that an ideal is proper, right? When the ideal is different from the whole algebra, right? So in this case, when the ideal i is different from a, right? And we say the ideal is maximal if the ideal is not contained in any other proper ideal. So what we have is exactly this. This is a, I'm sorry. This is a. Right, take an ideal, let's call it M. If M is maximal means what? If we try, you know, to come up with another ideal, in order to pick all the elements of M, we have only two options. Are we gonna fail, right, at some point? I'm sorry, actually we have three options. Or we are gonna stay exactly where we are. We're gonna coincide with M. Or the third option, we are gonna pick the whole algebra, all right? Being maximal means like M cannot be contained in any other proper ideal, all right? So now let's just make some examples, provide some examples of ideals, okay, all right? So for instance, if you consider the algebra C, right, as we just introduced before, right, the algebra of the, the, of the sequence, the convergent sequence, right, this, if you consider this set right over here, formed by all the sequence on C such that the ith entry is zero, this is an ideal, okay? What I'm saying is this, and I is formed by I'd say i equals one just to make my life easy. If we pick zero here, then the two here, then the three here, and so on. All right. I'm saying this just the first entry is always zero. This is an ideal of C. All right. Uh, it, it is not hard to see that this idea is actually a maximal ideal maximal ideal. All right, so, and another example, just you know, to illustrate, for instance, if you consider B of A, right, where, uh, where B of A we have just defined before, the, this is gonna be the Banner algebra of all continuous and linear operators, right? This, well, how we have discussed before, this is the Banner algebra, Right, and for instance, the set formed by all compact operators or the set, the set formed by all weakly compact, compact operators, they form two, two ideals on B of A, all right? So this is just to illustrate an example in a non-commutative case, right? So, and finally, let me explain what I meant by a complex homomorphism. Okay, 
We say that a map from A to C is a complex homomorphism if it satisfies two conditions. First one, the map is linear, right? And the second one, when the map is also multiplicative. And by multiplicative, I mean exactly the following. The image of the product is the product of the image, right? So from the algebraic point of view, we have exactly a homomorphism of algebras. But sometimes when you being more specific in the working on Banner algebras, people call it a complex homomorphism, but they are precisely the same, All right? And you know, and at last, let's just establish, establish some one more notation, right? I'm gonna denote by M of A, the set for the, the spectrum of the algebra. And by spectrum, I mean what? I mean all multiplicative linear functionals. I mean, I mean I, I'm saying, MMA is formed by all complex homomorphisms that are different from the zero one, okay? And we are gonna also denote by delta A, right? The set of all maximal ideas of A, right? So what we have is this. A map phi belongs to M of A. That means that phi belongs to the dual, okay? And this is true, right? Because A is a, is a Banner algebra, right? And for Banner algebras, every complex homomorphism is continuous, right? Which also satisfies the condition, preserves the multiplication. In other words, we are dealing with map that preserves the algebra structure. All right, so. And we are gonna denote by delta A, the set of all maximal ideals of A, right? So we have reached the point where we wanna, you know, to tie down these two concepts, right? From on one hand, we have the spectrum of A. On the other hand, we have the, the delta A, the set of all maximal ideals of A. So that is a way to compare these two sets, right? As we're gonna see in the sequence. So if we, if we pick any element in the spectrum of A, so it is not hard to see that the kernel of this map is actually a maximal idea. So the kernel of the map belongs to delta A. So what we have is this. If phi belongs to M of A, kernel the phi of phi is equal to M and M belongs to delta A, all right? But the, the thing is, we don't know in general if this set is not empty, all right? That's the thing. Usually we don't know if this set is empty, right? And we also don't know if delta A is not empty, but since we are assuming that A is unital, this guy is not empty for sure. But this is a question mark. Here is always different from empty set on the empty sets because A is unitary. All right, so if we choose an arbitrary element of the spectrum of A, is it, it is true that the, the kernel of this map belongs to delta A. But the, the question is, if we pick the maximal idea in delta A, is it true that we can find an F, a map phi that belongs to the spectrum of A? And the answer for this question is positive if we, we assume that the, the algebra is commutative, okay? And in, in order to see this, it, it is not hard, right? Because this is more like a consequence of the gelfa mesa theory, right? If we fix M to be an element of the delta of, of delta A. So if we consider the, the, the factor algebra A M, we know that this guy has to be isometrically isomorphic to C. So now, if we consider the map phi, that sends a, an arbitrary element A to its conjugate, conjugacy class A bar. So we have two things. First, this map belongs to M of A. Right, and secondly, the kernel of this map has to be M. All right, 
The second part fo follows directly from the fact that M is different from A, right? And I'm sorry, not because it is different from A, but because you know the only chance the conjugacy class is zero, right? Is, is that it is if the element actually lies on M, right? So, so we have a map that's linear, is multiplicative, and by the Gelfand-Mazur theorem, we can associate this map as a linear functional, right? So, in other words, what we, we, we can say, right, is, is it is that there is a bijection between the spectrum of A and the set delta of A. So once, once you have answered the question for the commutative case, we can try to think what is gonna happen if A is non-commutative. Unfortunately, in the non-commutative case, we don't have guaranteed in general, right? That we can establish some sort of a bijection. For instance, we could consider the spectrum of the algebra B of C zero. This spectrum is empty as a consequence of this theorem, right? And this is a, a, a reference here the, of, from this book, all right? Banner algebra is an automatic continuity, all right? And I'm sorry, I skipped too much. Okay. Uh, and, and, and the result that we use is, the, is that uh, C0 is isomorphic to its square. So, for, a, for any Banner algebra, I'm not any Banner algebra, for any Banner space where we have this condition, all right, this, the, the space B of the, whoever is the, the Banner space has no finite, that has no, how should I say put this, has no, oh my goodness, has no ideals of finite co dimension. In particular, that has no finite, has no maximal, maximal ideas of finite co dimensions. So for this reason, the spectrum of BFC zero has to be empty, all right? So the main goal now for us is to provide an example of a non-commutative Banner algebra such that we can actually establish a bijection between the spectrum of A and delta A. So that's our goal here, all right? For this, we are gonna to introduce a a little bit more of, no, of notation, right? From now on, unless stated otherwise, I'm assuming that the algebra is commutative, all right? From now on, M is gonna be a fixed natural number greater or equal than two. And by omega, I mean the set formed by all the natural numbers up to M, all right? And by MM, Right, I mean the, the complex algebra of all MM matrices, right? And here we are considering the standard sum and the product of matrices. And by UTM, right, we mean the, the, the unit of subalgebra of MM form, formed by all upper triangular matrices. What I'm saying is this, let me just clear. So we have MM. Right, we are considering the, the subalgebra UTM, and UTM is formed by matrix of this form. Whoever lies below, right, the main diagonal has to be zero. This is UTM, right. Is what we have so far. And in for convenience, right, let me just you know establish one more notation. I'm gonna write EIJ to denote the unity matrices. For instance, if I equals one, J equals two, and M equals three. We have this. this is gonna be zero 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 e zero 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 here. All right. So by matrix unity, I mean 
a matrix where we have zero elsewhere. And at the ij position, we have exactly the unit of the algebra. Is the, this is what we have. And with this notation in mind, right, we can actually say that an arbitrary uh, element of MM can be written in this form. And an arbitrary element of UTM can be written in the same form, but here we need to play it out if the element lies below the main diagonal has to be zero. So that's pretty much it, all right? So, and I promise you, this is gonna be the, the, the last part regarding notation, right, in terminology, okay? Uh, by Xm, we, we are considered the Cartesian product of X with, with itself and times, right? where the sum and the product and multiplication by scalars are defined the standard way, right? And for instance, we could consider uh, Xm equipped with the sup norm, for, for example. We, can, we could have considered equivalent norms as well. So now comes the, 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 the really important part from my point of view, right? For each matrix A, right? We can associate a map A bar right, that belongs to BXM in the following way. In this way, it's not very clear what, what I'm saying. We can just think in the following way. For instance, if you consider M equals two, you have a matrix A, A11, A12, A21, A22. How is the associated map A bar? Why bar does? What we are actually used to do, right? Once you have the matrix, you multiply in the following way, x1, x2, right? This is the map A hat. So we consider the matrix and apply on the column vector. So with this in mind, right? For each matrix A, right? we can associate a map, a map A hat that actually belongs to BXM. In other words, this map is linear and continuous, right? So actually we can say more. We can, we can identify this algebra MM as a close, with a closed linear subspace of BXM, right? More precisely, we can, we can identify this set, right, MM, with a closed unital subalgebra. What I'm saying is this. We have BXM, all right? And let me be a little bit sloppy, right? I'm gonna write inside here, MM. Here, I mean, think in terms of that, I, the, of the identification A hat, right? So. As I said here, of course, we cannot think of the matrix instead of the XM, but we can think about the map A hat. So, and inside of MM, we have UTM. But the thing I want to point it out is the following. I said that MM, MM can be identified with a closed unit of sub algebra. That's the thing we, you got to be very careful because, you know, when I say, it, Unit of sub algebra, that means the unity is the same. In other words, if you pick the identity operator of BXM, if this guy is the identity operator, this guy also lies on inside of UTM, it also lies inside of MM of X. Right, that's the thing usually people sometimes mess up, you know? You can have a subalgebra that has a unity, but not necessarily is the same unit. When I say the subalgebra is a unit of subalgebra, you're considering this exactly the same unit. This is, this is crucial for, for, for things we're gonna do. All right, so now let's proceed. All right, so 
before actually stating the, the, the next result, let me just make some comments. I just wanted to remind you guys what, what we're doing. We are trying to, to find an example of a non-commutative algebra where we, where we can actually show that we have a bijection between the spectrum of this algebra and the set of all maximal ideas. This is what we're trying to do. So the first, our first try, all right, was with the algebra MM, okay? So before trying to understand the spectrum of this algebra, we try actually to understand its dual, all right? So this theorem, that you know, there was a joint work with Professor Luisa de Moraes, which is a professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, right? We proved the following. If you have X to be a unit of Banner algebra with dual X star, then the dual of MN is topologically isomorphic to the Cartesian product of the dual of X with itself M square times, all right? Here, I just want to make a, a, very, a very simple comment, all right? This theorem, right, it holds even the algebra is non-commutative, right? But I want to fix the algebra to be commutative because for our purpose today, I'm going to need X to be commutative, right? But this result holds them very more general context, right? So once you have, we have figured out who is the dual of the algebra MN, we could ask, ask the following question. Among all the elements of its dual, which ones are multiplicative? In other words, which ones actually lie on the spectrum of MM? And in order to answer this question, right, we prove the following proposition, right? So I didn't write it down, but here we are assuming that the spectrum is non-empty. So I should have written the following. Suppose that we have an element on the spectrum of MM. If that happens, then, then we have what? The image of phi of the, I'm sorry, the image of the element X E I J under phi is gonna be zero for all X and for all I J in omega, where I is, is different from J. Secondly, the image of E I I is either one or zero for all I in omega. Actually, we, we were able to prove more, right? We proved that exists at the most one P, actually there exists only one P where phi at applied on EPP is gonna be one. And phi of X EII has to be zero for all I different from P. This is what we had. Okay, if we assume that the spectrum is now empty, so we have these two conditions, all right? So essentially the map is almost zero, right? Almost zero. So now using this result, right? We are able to prove the following. So we actually show that the spectrum of MM is also empty, right? So let's suppose, right? The spectrum is not empty. So we can find an element of this on the spectrum. Now, if you use the previous theorem, so we have these two conditions, right? Using this, we know that phi of E P P is equal one and phi of E I J is gonna be zero for all pair I J in the Cartesian project, uh, I'm sorry, Cartesian product omega to itself. So now if we set A to be this element, right, where I is different from P, that, that's important, okay? Now, if you compute A, A square, we have this, all right? Now, if you apply phi on this, what are we gonna have? Here, in this part is zero, in this part is zero, in this part is zero. The only left part is, is exactly in the first one. This is gonna be two times phi of EPP, but this is one, so it has to be two. On the other hand, since phi is multiplicative, we can pass the square, right? We can actually, I mean, the square commute, right? Phi of A square is equal to the square of phi of A, right? So this is pretty much phi of EPP is gonna be one. So we arrive at a, at, at a contradiction. In other words, the spectrum of M, M of X is gonna be empty. Using this, we can actually obtain a very, 
interesting uh, consequence. The spectrum of BXM is also empty. So if you look at, at our diagram, right? The spectrum for BXM is empty. The spectrum for MMM is empty. Okay? So in order to prove the spectrum of BXM is empty, so let's suppose that's not, that's not gonna be the case. So pick phi to be an, an, an element of the spectrum, right? So what can we do? If you look at the picture, right? There is no harm if you can consider the restriction, right? We can restrict the map phi that, that acts on BXM to MM. You can consider the restriction. Now, if you consider the restriction, so by the previous conclusion, we know that the spectrum of the MM has to be empty. In other words, this map that we are considering has to be identically zero. But now comes my earlier co comment. I have comment that the identity is the same. We are using the same identity. We have the same identity. So, in other words, we can, we can conclude that phi of i is equal to zero. So phi has to be identically zero, what, which tells us that the spectrum has to be empty, all right? Because by definition, the spectrum is formed by all, by all non-zero, right? Complex homomorphisms, all right? So if the, the complex homomorphism, right? annihilates the identity, it has to annihilate the whole space, right? That's the, the very simple, uh, it's kind of easy to see this, all right? So, so far, we are not doing so great, right? Because this spectrum is empty. This spectrum is empty. So what is gonna be our, our next try? Let's look at this, at, at this spectrum. And in this case, we are gonna be successful. We are gonna see that this spectrum is not empty, all right? So, it is not hard to see that this spectrum is not empty, but here, what is crucial is the fact that X is commutative. X is commutative since X is commutative, we can find an element G in the spectrum of X. As I said from the beginning, I'm gonna fix X to be commutative because for our purposes, it's gonna be crucial. So here, we need X to be commutative. So what you're gonna do is, what you're gonna do is exactly this. Now fix P, the element of omega, right? And we can define the following map. We, we could consider phi of G P applied on A, all right? This is gonna be G of applied on A, P, P. Okay, let me just write this better. Uh, okay, G of a, B, B, right? Just, I just want to remind you all that A belongs to UTM in this case, all right? It is not hard to see that this map belongs to the spectrum of UTM. So with this example in mind, we can, we can say for sure that the, the spectrum is not empty. But that brings us to another question. What is the other question? All the elements of the spectrum are exactly of this form. They have to be some sort of a projection composed with a element of the spectrum of X. So that, that is the question. For some phi on M, of UTM, can we find G and P such that phi is phi G P? Okay, 
That's the question. And in this case, fortunately, the answer is yes, all right? So this was also a result in a joint work with Professor Moraes, right? If we pick an arbitrary element of the spectrum of UTM, so we can find a number P on omega and an element G on the spectrum of X such that the map phi is of the form phi g p. In other words, phi of a is a g of a p. So, and the final question, right? If now we have described Okay, all the, the elements of the spectrum of the upper triangular matrices, we know how to characterize all the kernels, right? All the kernels has to be of this form. The kernel of a map phi is of the form matrices of UTM where the PP entry belongs to the kernel VG. And also, this has to be a maximal ideal, right? Because kernel of elements of the spectrum are maximal ideals. Now the question is, is, is it true that every maximal ideal of UTM has this description? And the answer in this case is also positive, okay? If M is a maximal ideal of UTN, then we can find a map G on M of X such that M is, of the, is formed by all the matrices, right, of UTN where the PP entry belongs to the kernel of G, all right? And now if we combine this theorem with the previous one, so if we combine this theorem with this one, we can say exactly this. There is a bijection, right, between the spectrum of UTM, right, and the set of all maximal ideals of UTM of X. All right? So to the best of my knowledge, right, I don't, I, I think it's the only example known so far. All right, I don't know any other example where we can actually you know, establish the bijection because as you, can, you guys could see throughout the talk, most of the, the examples that we tried at least, the spectrum were even empty. So in some sense, we got kind of lucky. You know? We are not able to show an, an example where the spectrum is not, not, is not empty but we were also able to characterize all, this, all the elements of the spectrum, all right? And we could compare with all the maximums, maximal ideals of the algebra, all right? And yeah, that's, that's pretty much. Thank you, thank you guys all. So if you guys have any questions. For the talk. Uh, do you have any questions for William? No, nice talk. Uh, thanks. I was rehearsing earlier because, you know, it's been a while since the last, last time I spoke in English. <laughs> I should have been rehearsing in Portuguese. But... <laughs> uh, I, I mean, uh, a, a funny thing, I wrote Braga earlier to 